Good morning, all. And as uh, you might recall, that they are doing on the uh, quality systems, quality management systems, and all. And today we have ISO 22000 to be done. We have covered uh, a few units last time. We have covered till the unit seven, uh, day one and day two. There are five uh, classes on uh, uh, ISO systems. My management systems and the day one we did unit one two and three day two we have covered till unit seven and today we have to do uh, my plan is to cover up eight nine ten and eleven if time permits we'll complete eleven or at least we'll start with uh, eleven so uh, let's start with our today's session of uh, unit eight that is uh, we'll be doing in detail ISO 22000. We'll cover today, as I just said now, we'll cover uh, four units today. So the first being the unit 8, ISO 22000. So uh, please understand that this IGNO counseling session is just a counseling session and not a, a you know, proper lecture session. So if it, it will be good if it becomes slightly interactive session uh, you know, you uh, you can come up with your questions or uh, or any queries on this part. I hope everyone has at least gone through this your study material once. We'll be following your study material exactly because so that you know you can also catch up with what I am telling later on. So we'll be taking up now uh, unit A ISO twenty two thousand. So uh, we'll start with unit date. I hope you have your study material with you so that please go to, you, you can open up your unit eight, which is ISO 22000-2005, an overview. So the first unit on ISO 22000 is about an overview of 22000. When you say overview, it just tells you, you know, what, uh, what all are covered under this uh, particular system. Uh, and in this unit, it also gives how is 22,000 system linked with HACCP. I don't know how many of you are familiar with this terming HACCP. I'll tell you what this terming is. Otherwise, you will never be able to understand when we are talking about HACCP and all. So uh, uh, the link between this ISO 22000 and HACCP and also uh, the benefits, the elements and benefits of 22000 and then it gives a sh short introduction and who all can use and how to use, what is the key features of this 22000. Okay, so uh, let's uh, start with the introduction part. Uh, it's about, about this ISO 20,000 is about the food safety management system. Now, when I say food safety management system, it is directly telling you about that it has got something to do with the food industry, right? So this ISO 22,000 is generally used by a food um, business or operator, which is called in a brief, it is called FPOs, food business operators. Now, food business operators definitely can use 22,000. Other than that, the people who are supplied, who all are interrelated with this food business can also use this ISO 22,000. Right, so ISO is what we have already seen in our previous classes. It is International Organization for Standardization. It, was lo it is located in Geneva. It was set up in 1947. Various kinds of ISOs, uh, management systems are there, which are specific for specific industries, covering up certain specific requirements. And this, as we have just said, is uh, not very specific for food, but yes, it is definitely a food uh, safety management system, which can also be used to all the interrelated chains relating any food business, right? So we'll go to the key features of 22,000. Now in the uh, 22,000, see there is, it is interrelated with the HACCP. HACCP 
just now I told you, if you are not very familiar with HACCP, I'll tell you what HACCP is so that you understand when I'm talking about this. It is Hazard Analysis Critical Control Point. It is an abbreviation. It is an abbreviation for where H stands for Hazard, A stands for Analysis, C stands for Critical Second C stands for control and P stands for points. Now what do you mean by this? It, it's a, it seems that it's a very long term. Hazard analysis critical control point is nothing but you are controlling the hazards at the time of its entry, entry into a food chain. Okay, any food flow control is done by is done by using this HACCP plan. HACCP plan is you are checking the entry of a hazard into the flow chart. In brief, in a layman's language, if you want to know what HACCP is, it is just that you are checking the hazard entry and at the in the in the flow chart in flow chart of any food process. Supposing it's a you know um, uh, let's take an example of uh, potato chips. If it's a uh, manufacturing of potato chips, you all know that the raw material will be the potato. So from where does this potato come? And then next, so uh, uh, item, which ingredient which will be used is the oil. These are the two major things which will be used in a potato chip. So whatever hazard is there from potato and from oil, this needs to be checked right at the beginning of the process. That kind of a plan is called hazard analysis critical control point. We in, it is uh, again dealt in depth as we go forward. But just to understand what HSCP is, I have just explained. Okay, now if you look at the ISO 22000, this incorporates uh, HSCP also. Why? Because there are certain prerequisites programs and all that. Along with this, completely together, it sets up a food uh, uh, management system, food quality management system. So there is a systematic approach which will have a continual improvement. Why we talk about continual improvement? Because in every step, you need to you need to revisit uh, the processes. And wherever there are lacking, it is like doing an audit. We have uh, studied about the audit in our previous class, how an audit is done. Similarly, every step you go back, you check whatever lapses are there, you improve and you fill that gap. That is called continual improvement. And interactive communication. What is interactive communication? It is a communication between, between the groups within that flow, within that flow of a process. Right? That is the communication between a raw material uh, procurement, then uh, maybe it involves a cleaning step, then a, a, you know, a, a cooking step, whatever. So every group, interaction among every group brings about the improvement in the system. Then there are prerequisite programs. Prerequisite programs are basically the programs which you implement in the whole process to bring out quality. That is, if again I take an, the simplest example of a potato chip, the prerequisite programs will be the cleaning of the place, how well the uh, area should be maintained, what should be the infrastructure requirement. Again, because all this contributes to the quality of the product. Then the traceability. Traceability and crisis management, it says. See, traceability and crisis management comes into picture when there is a recall or when there is a complaint, there is some concern in something, you need to go back and understand which particular batch had this problem. And for that, is this traceability required? In all the quality management systems, and uh, like we did in the previous uh, classes also, we are taken examples and we have done. The traceability is important. Why traceability is important? So that whenever in, uh, the, in the process we have done, it is plan, uh, do, check and act. So how will you act 
we have done in detail what our PDCA cycle is. So how will you act? You can act only if you are able to trace to which particular problem that a complaint has come. So for that, this traceability is very important. Now this was the picture which uh, we have uh, just explained in your uh, study material, page number six. Now if we go to, now you have understood at least each terms, what are the requirements of this system. And now if we go to the system components, that is the next page, page number seven. Okay, the system components. See, again, the system components, it is one of the very important component is HACCP. You will find that there is a pyramid diagram. And why is the, what is the significance of this pyramid? Why is it shown as a pyramid is? The basic, the most important one which starts from is the infrastructure. Definitely a good infrastructure is required. And then good hygienic practices are required. It's all to give, bring out the best product. So you can see that PRP. PRP is the prerequisite programs. Now OPRP also you can see, that is operational prerequisite program. The pre, uh, PRP is for infrastructure and OPRP is the operational part because to maintain hygienic practices, you need certain kinds of operations like washing in this particular time, washing before the process starts, in between the process starts, how good the water quality should be, the water quality has also to be maintained and you know the workers hand needs to be clean. All the hygienic practices including the workers, including the uh, human uh, resource. And all these two comes under OPRP and PRP. And then above that in the pyramid you can see HACCP. And then finally is ISO 22000. So this ISO 22000 essentially incorporates your HACCP component. Right? So this is a very uh, important pyramid and looking into this one pyramid itself you can actually explain how ISO 22000 can be set up. Again you can see when we go down it is describing the PDCA. Now PDCA is the methodology which is to be used in all the system that we have already seen in last two classes. In every system that we have taken up you have seen that PDCA is the, is the uh, key word. In every system they say or whatever implementation you have to do, there is a plan, there is an action that is to do and then check and then act. Now we have done this also in last uh, class. What is the difference between do and act? Doing is just executing the plan. Doing is just what you have planned, you are carrying it out, the action. And then what you have done, you are going back and checking whether it is okay or not. That is a reviewing of what you have done as per the plan. If there is any uh, drawbacks in the checking, during the checking, that you have to take an action on that. That is the difference between the act and the do part of it. Okay, so that we have done this PDCA in detail. For the other system, it is the same. There is absolutely no difference when it comes to this 22,000 also. Now, earlier we said communication between participants in a food industry. So how the potential hazards, now what is this communication basically? Communication is about the hazards that has taken place and also the step whether to know the previous step was done properly, whether there was there anyone came across any hazard which was not removed in that uh, process, that is the communication between the participants in the food industry. And then uh, now in between, it it's also says a passport for exporting. Why is it a, it's a passport for exporting? See, ISO system, what does it do? It gives a customer the reliability that your product, if it is uh, coming from a company which has, which claims to have implemented a quality system, it gives you, uh, uh, you know, an additional benefit to the customer.
to accept a product, to, it gives a belief, it gives a confidence on the product, right? Any product when we take, we see that, okay, it, it has an ISI mark, we say that, okay, it's of a good product, it's a good quality because there are certain specifications which has to be met. Similarly, when you're exporting a product from a country, then when you export it, the buyer, the importing country, gets a confidence in your product when uh, you claim that it is done by, it is done under a certain ISO um, uh, management system. So for a food industry, it is 22,000. So when you give a certification that yes, this company is ISO 22,000 certified, then it gives a confidence for the buyer. So that is why it is said a passport for exporting. Right now, the uh, ISO 22000, it need not be certified by um, a third party certification. This you can always do a self claiming. Any food business operators can do a self claiming of ISO 22000 if all the components are met. But the customer or the importing country or any regulatory body anytime can have an authority to come and check if you're doing a self-claim, whether it is really meeting the requirements or not, right? In last class, we are also uh, seeing the role of a regulatory body. Isn't it? Whatever claim we make, the role of a regulatory body is what? To check whatever claims we are made is correct or not. So we can always do a self-claiming of the uh, system, but if you make a self-claiming, the uh, company should be always be ready to be audited by or checked by or verified by an external agency for the compliance of whatever claim we are making. So what happens is it's very easy to make another person believe that you are following the system when it is a third party certified. So when the certification, instead of self-claiming, it is done by an external agency, it becomes, it becomes easier for the uh, factory to make that claim. Uh, not factory, sorry. It becomes easier for the customer to believe that the system is in place rather than making a self-claim. But the self-claiming is allowed under ISO 22000. It's not compulsory that it has to be a third-party certification. Then we go to who should use ISO 22000. We have already discussed about this in the introduction class in the first unit itself. And just now we have also said that it is because it is a food safety management program. So it is used by any food business operator. It can be only a supplier. And further, it has listed out who all can be, it can be used. You can see just a farm, just a producer of a uh, food can also use it, ranches, fisheries, dairies. It has listed so many. And when it comes to manufacturers, we can have n number of manufacturing uh, uh, units when it comes to food, various kinds of food. Now, food service providers, food service providers are grocery stores, restaurants, cafeterias, all that has been listed. Other service providers is listed in E, sanitation service, distribution service. See, all these are not directly the food, but still they can use it because some way it is related to food. Because ultimately, it is the quality of the food which is important. And all these services, all these branches play a role to the quality of the product. For example, if we just take example of, you know, perishable things like milk, the distribution has got a very key role because the milk from a factory, if it doesn't reach the customer in a proper uh, maintained cold chain or in a properly maintained time within a short time and in cold chain, then the product uh, is of no use. So that is why all these services are also important when it comes to maintaining the quality of a product. And that is why all these people can use the ISO 22000 system. Product suppliers also, they have listed a number of uh, suppliers which can use this system. Now, why to use 22000? 
This is again very similar to why to use ISO. What is the importance of uh, uh, international standard organization systems that we have done in unit one? It is same. Like it gives, uh, you know, as far as food is concerned, it as establishes, implements in your organization. And to why it can maintain, it can help you to maintain what once you gain a particular confidence from your customer, it always a system in place helps you to maintain your system to the to the uh, expectation of your customers to ensure that the product do not cause adverse health effects to demonstrate compliance with external safety requirements there can be legal requirements regulatory requirements statutory requirement and customer requirement this uh, we have also done in unit 1 various kinds of requirements and there we are done in detail what is a legal requirement and what is a regulatory requirement. Because when it comes to food, you, uh, the, just a customer, uh, uh, sorry, a business uh, operator, a business person can, if he eyes only into the income or the profit of what he gains from doing this business, he can go to any extent to just to enhance the taste, but which can be harmful to the customer. So, uh, if a regulatory requirement and a legal safety requirement is not put in place, then the common man's health is under question. That is why all these requirements are put in place to regulate the uh, business operation, to evaluate customers' food safety requirements, to provide safe products, enhance customer satisfaction, to export food products and penetrate international market, to communicate safety issues throughout the food chain, to ensure that you comply with your food safety policy. See, and, and the last they have put to ensure that you comply with your food safety policy. This is where your self um, declaration brings more weightage. See, we are giving a policy and we stick on to that policy is very important without anybody coming into your uh, unit and controlling you you should be truthful honest to the policy which you have put forward if you say that yes i will maintain this this, this policy i will provide only safe products then you have to stick on to it and sticking on to a safe food uh, safe uh, food uh, distribution it also brings along with it a cost is attached to that. So it is a commitment made by a food business operator to provide a safe food to the general public. And that is why you comply with your own food safety policy. So this system, if you put in place in your organization, it takes care of all these requirements. And next, uh, in 8.5, page number 11, you can see how ISO 22000 and HSECP. Here it says how it is interrelated, how ISO 22000 incorporates HSECP into the system. Here we will deal in detail what HSECP is. We have just in nutshell, we have understood what HSECP is. But here, we are going to go to each step and understand what it is. We also said that there are some prerequisites. Okay, prerequisite programs. Now here, directly it is just telling you about what HSCCP is, how you set up an HSCCP in your organization. After this, after do, uh, uh, discussing about this ISO tie-up with uh, HSCCP, we'll also look into the prerequisite programs and all. The three steps, formation of a food safety team. This is very important, this formation of a food safety team, because after all, it is this team he, who is going to set up the complete system in the organization. So the knowledge that the team has about the product and the various hazards, the various quality aspects of the product is very important. That is why you will see that the first step is formation of food safety team. 
Next is description of the product. Now, why is this product description important? Because once you describe the product, then the complete uh, description of the product is not just the name of the product. It is along with the name of the product, it is the intended use. See, the next step you will see the description of end use of the product. It is the intended use. And then because the, based on the intended use, the description of the product can change. Supposing there is a milk-based supplement, the specification of a milk-based supplement for an infant will be different from an adult. Why? Because when it comes to infant, the specification is very strict. Because you cannot subject an infant to any harmful things in a higher level. But when it comes to adult, the specification is different. The tolerance levels changes. Now, drafting of process flowchart, verification of process flowchart. How do you verify the process flowchart? The flowchart, a team prepares sitting in a room, discussing and what has to be done. Now, with this flowchart, this is verified on the production floor of a food uh, organization food producing organization. There in the uh, floor of the production unit, you verify the flow chart, whether this is what has been prepared by the team is correct or not. That does, those are the three steps. Now, once this three steps all has been done, then you go to the HACCP seven principle. What are the seven principles? The first principle is, Conduct a food safety hazard analysis. How do you conduct a food safety hazard analysis? It says conduct a food safety hazard analysis. How do you conduct that? You conduct it because you have a flow chart with you. Okay. Now conducting a hazard analysis is in every step of the flow chart. Okay. Supposing we take, like, I started with an example of potato chips. Let's go by the, uh, the same example so that it's very easy to understand. Supposing there is a factory which is making potato chips. The first thing, the first step in the food chain in the pro, uh, process of the chip will be procurement of potatoes. Now, you procure the potato from which all farms. Okay, so what all can be the hazard at that point? Procurement of raw material, the hazards can be the most important hazard in a you know, vegetable product, in a food product which is made by vegetables will be, all of you will know that it is pesticide, right? Uh, pesticides are being applied to control the pest. So that becomes one of the hazards. So how do you control it? You control it by getting the product, by getting the material from a controlled farm. That is how this previously we saw who all can use it. Then that is how it goes to, you know, there is a concept called farm to fork, which means it starts from the farm level. So this, uh, procurement is done from farms where the pesticides are used the least it is being used. Somebody had called for uh, not able to enter. See, once the class starts, the class timing is 10. So kindly make sure all of you join at 10 or at least we have dated till 10, 5, 10, 10. Kindly join by that time so that you know if the class doesn't get distracted. This is a request for forthcoming classes also. Now we are doing, whoever has joined late, this information is just for them, that we have started with the overview of ISO 22000, which is a, a food safety management system. Uh, because from the name itself, you can understand it is applied for a food industry. Food industry does not mean it should be a food manufacturing unit alone. It can be any other uh, unit which is indirectly related to 
any kind of food business. That is at the farm level, at the agricultural level, the farmers who are, uh, you know, farming for uh, various kinds of vegetables and supplying to any food industry can, is also involved in this uh, food safety management system. Now we have already given the examples how it is done and uh, we are uh, dealing with the uh, seven principles of HACCP now. In the, it is in the page number 11 of your study material. The seven principles, conduct a food safety analysis that just now we have said is how we do that. We do that using our flow chart. Our flow chart helps to do in every step, procurement of raw material, then it comes to the unit, how it comes to the unit, how it is transported, is there a requirement for maintaining a cold chain, if it is there. So supposing if it is potato, it, is, it doesn't require any cold chain. But supposing if it is a, a say ice cream industry, the ice cream industry, the main uh, product, the requirement will be, the raw material will be the milk. And that milk requires cold chain for transportation. So like that in every, in every step of the flow chart, we have to do a hazard analysis and see what kind of hazard is, if there is a possibility of a hazard. And then next step is identification of your critical control points. Now you have already found that there are hazards in a, and you have identified them. Uh, 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 food safety hazard analysis has been done. Then you identify your critical control points. How do you identify the critical control points? And what is a critical control point? I think we need to first understand what is a critical control point. Critical control point means, supposing you have identified a hazard, that hazard cannot be removed in the further step. Further step of your process, of the food process flow, that is called critical control point. For example, if there is a, a you know a bacterial contamination, if there is a contamination of say salmonella, I don't know how many of you are from science background or how many of you are aware about food safety, about the um, you know various kinds of contaminants and all. I don't know. I can just quickly brief you various kinds of contaminants. One is uh, the broadly, if you say the chemical contaminants the physical contaminants and the biological contaminants. So all these bacteria, viruses, everything will come under biological uh, contaminants. Chemical contaminants will be the pesticides, the heavy metals or any other kind of preservative which is added. That can be chemical contaminants. Physical contaminants it can be, you know, any physical thing which can come, like from farm, if it is, things are coming. There can be, if it is along with the roots in the soil, there can be some, there from the soil, there can be some glass pieces, there can be small metal pieces. It's all possibility that if uh, completely, if it is uprooted and along with the roots, it comes. So that can be a physical uh, contamination, physical um, contamination or the physical hazard can be uh, there if it, uh, it comes along with the, uh, completely the soil part or if there is any uh, physical like uh, scissors, knives are being used for uh, the, uh, you know, the harvesting. There can be, it can break or a small part can fall uh, with the uh, material and come to the uh, industry. That is a physical uh, hazard. So identify your critical control point is every step you have to identify whether it is a critical control or whether it is not a critical control. Then you establish critical limits for each critical control point. That is, you have to set a limit. How much is allowed? How much is allowed? That you have to set. That is called establishing of critical limits. For example, if it is TPC, for example, for, if it is a total bacterial count. See, every product will have a bacterial count. 
and then you are setting up a limit say, saying that okay in this particular step i am setting up a limit of say um, 10 lakhs of uh, uh, 10 lakhs of uh, tpc 10 lakh cfu per gram i am setting up that limit then you have to set it up you have you have set up that limit as a critical control point in certain step of the food process next is what develop procedures to monitor critical control points then what do you do you have to monitor those critical control points how if you have set up a biological critical control point then you take the sample for analysis and then you have to wait till the analysis results are coming. So you have to monitor those critical control points. Supposing it is the oil temperature. Supposing it is an oil temperature. Or let's say the potatoes which has come, it has to be washed in cold water. You cannot expose it to hot water because there is a possibility of the potatoes being, um, um, being spoiled. So you have said that the critical control point there will be the temperature in which it is washed. If you are setting such a point, then what you have to do? You have to have a procedure to monitor it. You set up thermometers or if it is a bacterial critical control point, you have the samples collected for analysis. Then it is given to the lab for analysis. Develop, then you have to design corrective action. Supposing Whatever limits you have set, if a particular batch goes beyond the limit, then you have to have corrective actions in place. How do you correct it? Then create a food safety record keeping system. For all these uh, steps what you are doing, every monitoring that you are doing, you have to have a food safety recording system also. You record all your observations. Validate and verify your system. Finally, it says validate and verify your system. What is validating and verifying your system? Now you have set up a system that in this this step, this 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 will be monitored and this will be recorded. If it goes beyond this point, it will be controlled. A corrective action will be taken. All this you have put in place. Supposing. It is going out of the system, out of your uh, allowed limit several times. Then what do you what do you understand from that? Something is wrong. That is why it is many a times it is going outside the critical limit. That means you have to go back. You have to validate your system. You have to verify that there is something wrong in the system. That is why many a times it is being uh, going above the limit. Okay, it is like supposing your vehicle, it switches off on its own many a times when you are using it. Something wrong with my vehicle, there is something wrong with my bike, that is why it is switching off, off on its own several times when I am on the road. So you go and you check the system. That is called the verification, that is a corrective action has to be put in place because there is something which is wrong. But at the same time, there is a regular um, uh, servicing of your vehicle also. Right? The regular servicing of your vehicle. That you don't wait for the vehicle to break down for the regular checkup or regular oil change or filter change or whatever has to be done for your system. For that, you don't wait. That regular thing is different from a breakdown visit or a, another uh, different is it where you find that, where you sense that there is something wrong and then you try to put a corrective action in place. Okay? So that is what uh, is uh, the seven principles about HACCP. Here again you will find that and the next uh, page you will find critical control and HACCP plan consists of at least the following information. That is the CCPs hazard that will be controlled at each CCP. CCP, this word is very important, critical control point. Pro procedures that will be used to monitor CCPs, actions that will be taken by limits are violated. Now, ISO 22000 shows organizations how to combine the HSCP plan 
with a prerequisite program or programs and operational prerequisite program into a single integrated food safety management strategy. Okay, now ISO 22000 means this HACCP as well as your prerequisite programs together it forms the ISO system. Now what is Codex Elementarius? In the same unit, in page 12, you will find about Codex. Now, Codex was established jointly by FAO and WHO. What is FAO? Food and Agriculture Organization. Right. And WHO? It's a, it's a bus term, so I don't think there will be anybody who doesn't know WHO. It's World Health Organization. Since pandemic, WHO has been questioned and WHO is in, in picture so much. So every common man now knows about WHO. Now what is Codex Elementarius? Codex Elementarius publishes a collection of standards. You know, every person, if he or she follows their own standard or their own way of doing things, there won't be any harmonization among the uh, business operating people. So what will happen if there is no harmonization? There won't be any homogeneity in the product, in the process. If everyone follows certain specification, laid down by a certain international uh, organization, then we, it gains, and you know, it helps us to achieve a particular quality of a product. Homogeneity will be there. It will be uh, harmonized among the countries. So if this kind of, to bring the harmonization among the countries, this Codex Elementarius put certain standards in place. Now what are these standards? Standards are also for various kinds of products. Products means it can be food additives, it can be, uh, you know, uh, various kinds of vegetables, it can be spice, any product. So, Codex puts certain guidelines how to follow this and bring out the quality product. This Codex also describes certain um, practices how to practice, how to, uh, you know, the hygiene practices and all that, how many times the washing should be done, what should be the quality of water to be washed. Now, what, how do you monitor it? Now, we say that the quality of water to be used, okay, water can be tested. Now, there, is, there are certain guidelines on how to, you know, even clean the uh, food contact surface. That is what the term they use. They don't say the table on which the food is going to be handled. They say the food contact surface. So the, how the food contact surface has to be cleaned, how many times it should be cleaned for using various kinds of products. For example, if it is a fish industry, then they will say, okay, what all kinds of various kinds of uh, cleaning mechanisms should be used. What is the temperature which should be very critical? Temperature is very critical when it comes to perishable items. Okay, how it should be maintained? What should be the uh, total bacterial load? And then after the washing, now supposing there is a guideline and you have done the washing of the surface. How do you check whether it is okay or not? You can check by taking the swab test of the table. Okay, the swab test you can take a swab test of the table and check if it is within your set value. That is how um, it is, uh, you know, arrived that the cleaning process has been perfect. But so, if there is any problem, then they can correct it. Suppose if the bacterial load has not come within the um, uh, set limits. Then what do you have to do? It means that the scrubbing is not enough or the soap solution which has been used is not enough or the sanitizer what has been used is not enough. So they can, they can change the process. They can go back and they can make the amendments in the procedure and put it back in place so that all the practices or the guidelines are followed and it meets the 
limits which has been set. The commodity standards, commodity standards, just I said, I told you that Codex sets up the standards for the commodity. The major commodities including in the Codex are cereals, pulses, derived products including vegetable protein, fats, oils and related products, fish and fishery products. See, all these products, Codex has defined a particular specification like for example, if it is, um, say, various kinds of pulses and all, the minimum protein content should be this, the total ash should be this, there should not be any added color. All these are specifications. There should not be any mold and yeast and mold on the product. Okay, there should not be any aflatoxin. And now, it's not that it should be zero. It, it, there is a limit defined for all that. So when a particular specification set by Codex is met by a particular food business operator, then the product can be claimed as a quality product, isn't it? When that is why this Codex has set up all these and then we say that, okay, it is as per the quality which has been set by the Codex. Now, Manual of Codex Elementarius Commission consists of scope, the description, that is the definition of the product or products covered with an indication, essential composition, food additives, contaminants, hygiene, dates and measures. See, it is so important, these weights and measures are also covered by what is labeling, labeling what is the requirement of how the labeling should be done. Labeling should not lead to an ambiguity among the customers. The labeling should be perfect. It should have clarity on what they are claiming. Methods of analysis and sampling. Whatever methods have been used for particular test, that is also listed in Codex. Next is the HSC. A brief, a very brief, they have given what an HSC, which we have already uh, done in the previous um, uh, clauses, we have done what HECCP and this ISO uh, club is. Then comes the ISO family, where various ISO uh, traceability to food chain, all this has been listed. I think it, it is just a matter of reading and understanding what it means. Then we can go to key elements and benefits of 22,000. And also we have covered, but now here it is given in detail about the benefits and key elements of 22,000. We have said that there has to be an interactive communication. Clear communication along the food chain is essential to ensure that all relevant food safety hazards are identified, adequately controlled at each step. This is the communication among the various sections in a food business that various hazards are identified and it is nullified also. It is put in control, how the controls are put in place. Now system management, the most effective food safety systems are designed, operated and updated within the framework of a structured management system. This provides maximum benefit for the organization and interested parties. Then comes the hazard control, which we have already seen the seven steps of how the HSCP is put in place. It uses the hazard analysis to determine the strategy of hazard control. Benefits for users. What, how will you benefit the user, that is the end user? Organization implementing the standard will benefit from organized and targeted communication among the trade partners. Like there are importing countries, then you can have a very good communication. Why? Because when you say that this my company is ISO 22000 certified, then it gives a confidence to the importing country and it understand, they understand that yes, there is a harmonization, there is a particular specification followed. So it gives a, it gives a confidence for the importing country to believe the product, to avoid uh, 
actually to enhance the hassle free trade among the countries optimization of resources internally and along the food chain improved documentation better planning less post process verification more efficient and dynamic control of food safety hazard all control measures subjected to hazard analysis systematic management of prerequisite program wide application because it is focused on end results valid basis for taking decisions increased due diligence control focused on what is necessary and saving resources by reducing overlapping system audits okay now benefit of other stakeholders as i already said the confidence that the organization which are implementing have the ability to identify and control food safety standards value added features we have already seen what are the features how does uh, value addition comes in uh, place when we have iso it is an auditable standard a clear requirement it is internationally accepted because it is an iso it integrates and harmonizes various existing national and industry based certification schemes food processing industries are waiting for this standard for this standard it is aligned with iso 9001 and hccp it contributes to a better understanding and further development of hccp prp what is prp pre requisite programs okay with this we end this an overview of 22000 and there are few questions which can be attempted and then the keywords are explained at the end of this unit there are few keywords that are uh, explained okay let's start with after the break uh, on iso 22000 2005 the structure about this iso 2000 how it is documented the documentation structure is what the main thing which is covered under this unit now we can go to the uh, page 26 of your study material where the clauses have been described If you can open up your unit number nine, page number twenty-six, the clause number nine point three, you can see ISO twenty-two thousand two thousand five clauses. The standard is divided into eight main clauses. Now, in the introductory class, we had said that this documentation of the standards they are more or less similar, very similar. so that it's easy for the users to understand and to implement it the first one is generally the scope then it, there will be a normative references from where all the references has been taken third one is the terms and definitions okay the terms and definitions fourth one is the food safety management system the management responsibility is the fifth the sixth is the resource management seven is the planning and realization of the safe products eight is the validation verification improvement of the food safety management system now these are the eight clauses now let's go clause by clause okay let's go one by one clauses just quickly so that we understand what we are talking about now in the scope and normative references terms and definition and uh, these three it's all just you can understand what the heading itself is now in the fourth one the fourth safety management system from there the actual clauses start the general requirements and then the documentation and requirements general requirement will say about what is in general required for the uh, management system that is they have to be you know committed towards the management system what they are um, putting in place the that is very important that is a com commitment 
Yeah. And uh, what the, why the documentation system is required? Because until unless you don't document it, how will you communicate it to your the whole team or the <coughs> sorry to the team how the system is set up? That is why every system needs a very thorough documentation of the process. Now, the do under the documentation requirements, there will be control of documents and control of records. <coughs> Sorry. What does this control of documents and control of records means? Documents are your planning systems and the procedures are all your documents. And what are the records? The records are all the pieces of paper or an information. It need not be a piece of paper. It can be a information in a soft copy also. That is called a record which is generated which is uh, which is generated during a implementation of a process control or a, a particular procedure for example if i am checking the record if i am checking the temperature of say uh, milk i am procuring milk my unit is an ice cream manufacturing unit i am procuring raw milk from various farmers. So what uh, is my um, uh, recording there? I'm recording the temperature at which it is received in my unit. It is coming from far off place. It comes from, uh, it is coming in a refrigerated van. Now, whether the refrigeration of the van is maintained or not, we, I can easily check it out using the, using the temperature of my material. So I am checking the temperature of the milk at the time of receipt of each batch of the milk that is received in my unit, my factory. That becomes a record. How do you control it? And what is the meaning of controlling of these, the documents and records? That is an identification. You give an identification to your records and your documents and it can be traced back to which date, when, who has done it, all those information should be there in every piece of a record. In a document, who has written it, who has approved it, and is this the latest one? That is the control, the control status of a document. Now, what is the responsibility of the management? Management responsibility is given in under the clause 5, 5.1 the commitment given by the management towards the quality. See, however best the team is, however best the facilities are, the infrastructure facility, you have a very good food safety team with you know a very good educated people. All of them are postgraduates in food technology and all that. But if you're working in a factory where the management of the factory is not committed towards a safe food or a good food, healthy food to be supplied, then all this is a waste. That is why the management commitment is very important. The management should be committed to for a safe and good food. Food safety policy, then the food safety management system planning, responsibility and authority. Responsibility and authority, overall responsibility should be given to somebody <laughs> who will be responsible for the complete implementation of the system. Food safety team leader, then the communication. Communication is internal as well as external. Emergency preparedness and response, the management review, the review input and the review output. How the management reviews the situation in the factory and what is the input? The information which is given to the management and what is the output? Output is the actions which the management takes in case something has to be done. If there is a failure, if there is a requirement of improvement, and whatever a management does is the output review. Resource management, what all other resources required? See, the first thing is the human resource. The people who are working there whether they should be educated, what kind of skill is required, what kind of training is required, all that comes uh, sums up to the human resources. 
under human resources you will see general competence awareness training that is the requirement of the people who are going to work there then 6.3 is the infrastructure infrastructure is whether what kind of a table is required what kind of a lighting is required uh, what kind of a temperature overall temperature is required all that comes under infrastructure 6.4 is work environment the in, still uh, after all this the work environment also should be good now seven one is planning and realization of safe products general and prerequisite programs 7.2 is prerequisite programs which uh, it has it has been described again under three steps 7.2.1 2.2 and 2.3 appropriateness of prps prp is we said prerequisite programs which we mean uh, what uh, the standard means is it's all these programs are compulsory for a system to work that is called a prerequisite program like there can be certain statutory requirements there can be legal requirements that can be there can be regulatory requirements all that those requirements should be in please now preliminary steps to enable hazard analysis we have seen that the hazard analysis has to be done the food safety team needs to be set up product characteristics it has to be defined when we saw that in the previous unit that there are seven basic principle seven basic steps for setting up your hscp similarly characteristics of end product intended use the flow diagrams the flow chart of your processes description of the process all that needs to be defined then in 7.4 hazard analysis has to be done those are the pre steps which are done and then you do the hazard identification determination of acceptance level you need to determine what kind of hazard is acceptable okay then you go to hazard assessment selection and assessment of control measures which is very very important you have identified the hazard now what you have to do you have to establish the limits that is very important establishing and then in the complete hscp plan itself that is the step identification of critical control points the system for monitoring is now you have identified then what do you have to do you have to monitor it monitoring means what supposing i have set up the uh, temperature as one of the requirement then this is the temperature requirement then i need to set up the monitoring of the temperature then verification traceability of a system then control of non conformity what is control of non conformity supposing you have set up certain uh, acceptance criteria and this acceptance criteria is not met then there is a non conformity raised so this non conformity needs to be addressed and that is called control of non conformity what happens when a non conformity takes place you have to put corrections and corrective actions now what is the difference between correction and corrective action correction is correcting a mistake is just a correction corrective action is you are putting a process there in place so that this mistake does not happen again recurrence of a non conformity is stopped and that is called corrective action handling of potentially unsafe product now supposing there is an unsafe product identified how do you handle it evaluation then there is a re release evaluation for release disposition of non conforming products withdrawals can be there because it's a product now you have identified that there was a problem but that you identify later by the time the product has already reached the market then you withdraw it from the market then finally validation verification and improvement of the system this is actually a responsibility of the management to make sure that there is a continuous improvement and whatever was done is as per the system for that you put internal audit 
evaluation of individual verification results, all those have improvement and up, updating of the food safety management system. So we see that totally there are eight clauses. Okay, under these eight clauses, the first one will be the, always the scope. Second is the normative references, what all references has been used, the terms and various definitions and terms which is covered under the system. Then the food safety management system is the clause four. Five is the management responsibility. Six is the resource management. Seven is planning and realization of safe product. Eight is the validation, verification and improvement. Now everything is placed, is in place. You keep on improving that. Is the eighth clause. Now FSMS documentation structure. How do you do the documentation of this? We now we know what a food safety management system is. But how do we go about the documentation of this system? In the documentation system, there are different hierarchical levels of documents which is given in seven steps, which is one is a food safety manual, mandatory procedures, standard operating procedures or work instructions, HACCP five three steps related documents, seven principles related documents, miscellaneous documents, formats and records. Now if you go on, you can see what a food safety manual is. If you go to page number 29, of your study material, you can see a pyramid again. Earlier also we had seen one pyramid uh, kind of, we had seen a pyramid where they explained about, I explained about the ISO 22000. Here this pyramid is explaining about the documentation structure. What does this pyramid show? The pyramid shows at the peak is the food safety manual. What does it mean? This pyramid, when a something is placed at the peak, it means that, that becomes the policy document. In the food safety manual of a food business operator, all the policies related to the unit will be given there and that food safety manual will refer to the mandatory procedures. The mandatory procedures will again refer to the standard operating procedures. Standard operating procedure will have HCCP three steps related document. This three related document, three step related documents, which have, will be covering the HACCP principles related documents. And all this will have miscellaneous documents. What will be the miscellaneous documents? like whatever the cleaning, the hygiene practices, whatever the, the supporting documents will come under miscellaneous documents. And then the forms and formats. There will be specific formats in which the records are maintained. So this pyramid shows you how it is to be done. Now if we go to the next uh, you know, uh, page, you will see that the about the food safety manual, it has been said, the contents of different hierarchical levels have been shown, establishment and institution over the years, food safety policy and related objectives, and all that is given. We can go to mandatory procedures. What are the mandatory procedures? What do you mean by mandatory procedures? The term itself, when we say mandatory, the term itself means that it is essential, right? Without this, we cannot have a system in place. It is requirement of the standard. Without these procedures, you cannot put the system in place. So what are the mandatory procedures? Control of documents. How do you control the document? How do you control the documents? Document is controlled by giving a unique ID. A unique ID is given to the document. And then identification of who has prepared it. 
who has approved it and whatever changes has been done to that particular document all these are being identified and that is called i control of documents okay control of records what is the control of records control of records is again every record is identified by a unique number okay and then the unique number of the record will show that the record is used for this particular purpose the record will have entries which can be whatever activity has been recorded with the person who has done it the entry has been made the date the time everything will be there in a record that is what is called control of records emergency preparedness response information about potential emergency situation okay in a food processing organization there is a likelihood of the certain accidents it can take place so if it supposing it takes place what will be the action taken by the processor that has to be documented control of non conformity just now we said how to control the non conformities corrective actions which has to be in place if something goes wrong internal audits you are auditing your own process that we have done in the unit 2 right what is an internal audit internal audit is going back and checking your own uh, processes by your own people then it that is internal audit withdrawal supposing withdrawal is supposing a particular batch has been identified as unsafe how do you recall it that is your procedure for withdrawal now standard operating procedure so those are the mandatory procedures now what is a standard operating procedure sop or work instruction now you can just see a list of standard operating procedure is given okay for procedure for purchase how the purchase will be done who will be you know placing the order what all kind of uh, requirement has to be seen what is the procedure for traceability right you will find that every packet of you know a food which you purchase whether it is a packet of rice whether it is a packet of biscuits whether it is a packet of chips you will find that there is a batch code in that now how does you how do you get that batch code and batch code is from the procedure for traceability okay there is a procedure for traceability now how do you dispatch it how do you handle the customers complaints for every <coughs> activity of this kind of activity there has to be a procedure which is called standard operating procedure or the work instruction then the hscp pre steps related document how these are the pre steps the how is the hscp team form who all are there in the team what is their role in the product description the intended use of the end product which yeah, they are going to describe as per the hscp preparation of the flow diagram okay all this hscp principles related documents next is the principles related document how many principles are there hscp there are seven principles right which incorporates hazard identification determination of acceptance acceptable level hazard assessment is being done selection and assessment of control measures are being done establishing opr right operational prerequisite program opr establishing hscp plan identification of critical control points and then after identification what do you know you have to set the critical limit after setting the critical limit what has to be done it has to be monitored after monitoring you have to record it after recording you have to validate 
So that those are the steps. Then the miscellaneous documents, then the formats and records. So that is how a food safety team. <laughs> in your study material, there is a uh, in page number 33, there is a pyramid again given for food safety team structure. How a food safety team is formed. Okay. So that's the end of the uh, unit 9. We can now go to unit 10, which is a clause wise uh, description of your ISO 22000. We have just, in, in brief, we have seen what are all the clauses. There were eight clauses, and now in this unit, it describes how each clause is being done. Okay? So in your study material, kindly open your unit number 10, clause-wise interpretation of ISO 22000. We will go through clause-wise interpretation. Okay, we will go through this clause-wise uh, explanation of the standard, it, which is given in uh, unit 10. Right? Now, we saw that the first one is the scope. Okay, in the previous unit we saw the first one was scope. What do you mean by the word scope? Scope means to whom all is this standard applicable. Okay, applicability of the standard is described under the scope. And what does the standard say under scope? That the standard specify requirements to enable the food processor to what? Implement to whom all this is applicable. It is applicable to all food processors, irrespective of size, which are involved in any aspect of food chain. Right? It means that the it is applicable to all food processors. Okay, irrespective of size, which means that it can be only a very small uh, food industry where only one kind of product is uh, made. For example, there is a packaged drinking water. Let's imagine that there is a packaged drinking water. Now, packaged drinking water, uh, say um, uh, Green Valley or something. The unit is very small. They are producing only one product. What is the product? It is mineral water. That's all. That is a small uh, factory. As, at the same time, supposing we compare that with, you know, Cadbury's. Cadbury's is a huge one where there are so many various kinds of chocolates and this, that is being made. Various kinds of products are there. It's a, that is the difference of the size of the industry. But the standard is equally applicable to both the industries. It is equally applicable. That is why the scope, under the scope it says that it is applicable to all the food processors, nevertheless whatever is the size. Now what is in clause 2? Clause 2 is the references. Right. From good, which all bases the references or the cross reference is given. Standard to be referred is ISO 9001, quality management system, fundamentals and vocabulary. If you can recall, if you can recall our previous class, we had said that 9001, what does it cover? It covers fundamentals and vocabulary. Okay. So fundamentals and vocabularies are covered under 9001. So this is the referring to 9001 ISO. Okay. Now in clause number three, terms and definitions. Why is this terms and definitions? You know, all the standards, whether you, it is ISO 9000 or whether it is 22000, in every standard, you will find that there is a terms and definition and Every new term is defined in detail. Why is this definition given? So that there is a harmony in 
understanding what the standard wants to convey. Because the terms like correction, complain, critical limit, end product, all these are common terms. So when a standard says this, CCP or control measure or correction, what is the standard actually meaning by this term? Is defined under terms and definitions. Now CCP, step at which control can be applied and is essential to prevent or eliminate food safety hazard or reduce it to acceptable limit. Why I have read the CCP only because it is a very important definition. Okay? Correction, we have already seen corrective action, critical limit, end product, flow diagram, all these uh, terms we have already discussed. Right? You can just read and go through all these terms. Now, let's go to clause number four. In clause number four, food safety management system. Food safety management system is the first general requirement. The food processes is required to establish document, implement and maintain an effective food safety management system and update it when necessary. That is in general, it has, it has been told. Then it goes to, then it has to be controlled, periodically it has to be evaluated, all those in general requirements is given. Documentation requirement, previously we saw there are two kinds of documentation requirements. What are them? It was Control of document and control of records. Okay? Control of documents and control of records. Control of document, we have already said, but let me repeat it here once more so that it's very thorough with what does the standard mean by control of document. FSMS documents are required to be controlled. That is the statement given by the standard that the document needs to be controlled. What do you mean by control? Is control meaning that the book, the manual, the procedure should be under lock and key? The manager should keep all the documents with them. It should be under lock and key. It should not be available outside. Is that the meaning of the word control? No. That is not the meaning of the word control. Okay, control means, it means the word document control, the word control in the document control means there has to be a person who is designated to prepare the document, to approve the document, to reissue the document and that identification of the document should be there. It, will, it should be available wherever it has to be used. And then, there should not be any unintended use of obsolete document. Means, you have already made a correction, but the, again, the old document is still going on and it is being used by the people. Let's take one example for this to understand what control of document means. Supposing it is a sampling procedure. Okay, it's a sampling procedure. Now, what is sampling procedure mean? Sampling is from the table of the product, from the processing table, you are taking samples for checking. That is the procedure. Where should this procedure be available? It should be available where the activity is going on. Who should be writing it? The food safety team leader should be preparing it or you know the uh, food safety uh, manager or the supervisor should be preparing it. So it will be prepared by food safety manager or whatever, whatever designation we call somebody in the food safety team. It will be submitted to the team leader, team leader will go through it and will approve it. Okay. So where it should be available, it should be available in the production unit where the sampling has to be done. That is the control of the document. 
so it should be written or it has to be signed by the person who has approved now control of record a documented procedure is required to establish to define the controls needed for the identification storage protection retrieval retention time and disposition of records what well, is something which is missing the, uh, in this control of records is a record should be definitely be identified it should also identify the activity which has been recorded supposing it's a measurement of temperature the temperature who has measured it then they have measured all those details should be there okay now these are the two points control of record and control of document next class by is the management responsibility it you know there it's, it's so clear what should be the responsibility of the management whatever the requirements are there they have to provide they have to provide a safe and uh, you know in between do an audit check whether the systems are in place whether the requirements are met whether the right kind of personnel is provided or not all these are the requirement of the management what is the food safety policy food safety policy is it is a it policy means it is a declaration or a commitment which is given by the uh, by the organization that we will provide uh the uh, safe food and healthy food that is called food safety policy that is the declaration which is the claim made by it. so what is safe is appropriate to the role of the food processor conforms to the requirement of the standard that yes i will conform with the request for example we said that the codex put forth the requirement then we said codex elementarius put forth certain requirements of certain kinds of food now what all it will meet the requirements i will be meeting all the requirements of the particular standard it all comes under food safety policy a food safety management system planning planning of sms is carried out integrity of sms is maintained okay responsibility and authority who will do what that is the responsibility and authority food safety team leader there has to be a team leader a responsible person who will be given the responsibility of the complete implementation of the food safety management system that team leader will be responsible to report the effectiveness and suitability whether there is any gaps whether there is any flaw whether this is not followed all that responsibility lies with the team leader communication external and internal communication about the requirement of the customer about the requirement of the statutory body regulatory body all these the information has to be passed on to the person who is affected or who is doing the work and the chain has to be brought in the picture management review emergency preparedness and response and then the management review class six is resource management in resource management what all should be covered we have said that briefly in the previous unit see all this units no and the units on 22000 covers basically the structure it is first given to you as a small a very introductory form and then the next unit describes it in detail so if you are you have uh, studied if you have read one unit itself then itself you will understand about the whole system in class 6 in the previous unit in unit 9 we had said that what is covered under class 6 resource management we are covering human resource infrastructure and work environment provision of resources who will provide the resources the management has to provide the resources 
and then maintaining and updating that SMS will be done by the team leader. Under human resources, what all will be covered or what all will be the requirements? The requirements will be the what will, should be the competency of the person involved, how much awareness is required, what is, what is the education qualification, what is the training required for carrying out the particular job. And then the authority and the roles and responsibilities are to be defined. Planning, realization of safe product, broad coverages, prerequisite program, three steps to hazard analysis, OPRP, establishment of HSCP plan, updating PRP and HSCP plan. See why an updation of PRP is required, prerequisite plans, why should it be updated? Because there can always be a change in the programs. Based on your hazard analysis, that it can require a change, it can require an amendment. So whenever an amendment is required, an updation is also done. That is called an updation of the prerequisite program. Preliminary steps to enable hazard analysis. What are the preliminary steps? We have to appoint the food safety team. That is the first and the most important one. That the team has to be there for food and food safety uh, management system implementation. Now the product characteristics raw material, ingredient, and the product contact material. All this needs to be defined. Characteristics of end users. What kind of which, uh, who are the intended end user of the product? Composition, the biological, chemical, and physical characteristics. The packaging, the intended shelf life, and the storage condition. All that has to be, is, is that, is that, is a characteristic of the product. And how do you achieve it? You always need a flow diagram, the process step and control measures to achieve a particular system. Now hazard analysis, how do you do the hazard analysis, hazard identification and determination of acceptable levels. The preliminary information and data collected and then based on the experience, external information including epidemiological and other historical data. Using all this, it is set up. Acceptable level is set up. How, how much can the bacterial load be is set up based on all this data. And then an hazard analysis is done to determine for each kind of hazard is identified and Elimination, how elimination can be done. Selection, assessment of control measures. When you put a control measure, what will, how will you monitor that control measure? Establishing that also is uh, done by establishing the operational prerequisite programs, OPRP. Then the establishing the HSCP plan. HSCP plan is required to be documented and required and is required to include the information on each identified critical control point. See, in your study material, let me tell you this slightly, you know, overlapping and uh, you will find that there are a lot of repetitions also. So, it is, it is your uh, job to put those in place and you can actually make small short notes of what you are doing. When you are doing like 22,000, you make a structure in a flow diagram kind of thing to understand. Otherwise, if you just keep reading your uh, uh, study material, you will find that there are repetitions and you may get lost after some time that what uh, you may lost, uh, lose track of what you are actually doing. So it is always better when you are studying through your, uh, using your material, you always prepare a flow diagram kind of thing on the, the standards and all, so that you don't lose track of what you are going through. Then uh, the determination of critical limits for the critical control points. 
Once the critical control points have been identified, we need to set critical limits for that. It, all, it is always based on the product as well as it is based on the criticality of the point. Okay? It can be temperature, it can be you know, uh, time, it can be pressure, it can be anything. So once the limit is set, then you have to set up systems for monitoring that limit. And once you set up the monitoring limit, you have to also describe when the limits are exceeded, what action will be taken. And based on that, your system needs to be updated. Then the traceability system, which is very, very important to identify the product loss and the relation to batches of raw material processing and delivery records. Control of non-conformity. Just before that, we had seen what is correction and what is corrective action. Supposing there is something which is not as per your defined procedure, then it is called non-conformity. Now, once a non-conformity has been identified, how do you control it? How do you address it? You take the corrections and then you put a corrective action. What is a corrective action? Corrective action is put in place to ensure that the non-conformity is not repeated. That is called corrective action. Handling of potentially unsafe product. Now, during all this evaluation, re-evaluation and your monitoring, monitoring of CCP, you have come across a, a product which you have identified that this is not safe. Supposing there is a CCP where you are checking for, say, a bacteria called Salmonella. Okay? You have identified and that particular batch, from your uh, analysis reports, you know that that particular batch has got Salmonella. So what will you do? What should the business operator do? The business operator should not release that particular batch to the market. Why? If he releases, the health of general public who is going to consume it or the end user who is going to use it, the, it is risky for that person. Isn't it? Because salmonella is the pathogen. It's disease causing bacteria. So it's a pathogen. And so what should they do? They should be able to, they should have a procedure to withdraw it. Okay? That is how you control and withdraw. Now, Clause 8 is validation, verification and improvement of FSMS. How do you improve and how do you validate it? You have to go back, you know, to your records. You do it using the internal audits. One good tool to validation and to monitor the effectiveness of your system is by internal audit. So validation of control measures prior to implementation of control measures to be included in OPRPs and the HSV plan and after any change therein, the food process is required to validate that. The, what, what is validation here means? To confirm that whatever control measure I am putting, I am uh, getting the uh, intended output from that. The selected control measures capable of achieving the internet control. That is called validating. And you have to store all the validation records. That I am saying that, okay, if I control this material at 4 degrees of temperature, the bacterial load is under control. Now, whether when you keep it at 4 degrees, are you able to achieve what you are thinking or what you have put in place is called the validation. Control of monitoring and measuring. Whatever monitoring you have put in place, uh, sorry, whatever control limits you have put in place, you need to monitor and also measure and maintain a record for that. Okay? Food safety management system verification. 
How do you do a verification of now you have the complete food safety management system in place? Suppose your management system was put in place, now you need to verify it. How do you verify it? Okay? Verification is done by internal audit. An internal audit, <laughs> there can be non-conformities which has been identified, which again will call for a correction and corrective action. Analysis of results of verification activity is another uh, step when you analyze. Why do you analyze? So that you may improvement, continual improvement and updating the FSMS. Uh, how do you update it? When you see that, okay, this point at this point or at this step, this is continuously giving a problem in the, in the food chain, then you try to change it, correct it and then you update it with the latest requirements and with the latest changes. It only, then only an improvement will come into picture. Okay, that is the various clauses of uh, ISO 22000. That is the end of unit number 10. And uh, maybe we can cover unit 12, 11 because unit 11 also is uh, case studies of ISO 22000. Now, whatever we have uh, covered under these three clauses, it is basically implementation of the same thing into a, uh, a particular food uh, industry. How do we implement it is given in the clause number, uh, sorry, the unit number 11, where certain case study has been done. So that there is a total understanding of the um, system what we have talked about till now. Other than that, there is only uh, some exercises and the suggested reading for this unit. We can go to uh, the next unit, that is unit number 9, where uh, we have to deal with 22,000 structure. How it is documented? And what is the structure of 22,000? Okay, let's get back to our uh, topic. Now we are going to do unit number 11, ISO 22000-2005 case studies. Here, a one typical case of uh, food industry is taken up and then they are trying to put this ISO 22000 in place so that we understand how a 22,000 is put into place. Now, with, in introduction itself, in page number 62, you will see very nicely they have given how it starts. A typical sequence to be followed okay, by the consultant and the organization. If there is a consultant or if it is the organization is doing on its own, they can do on its own also. So what happens, the first thing is supposing an organization decides to put a, a system in place, first thing will be, there will be a meeting. The meeting will be done by the top management will be there. Then the concerned people will be there with the consultant. Now what, were the, what are the requirements that will be shared? Then the consultant will say what all kind of awareness training needs to be done. The guidance for documentation will be given. The review or revision of the documentation will be done. So the, the documents and everything once it is ready. Now for, finally this system will be implemented in the floor of the production. In, when it is being done in the floor of the production, then there may be a requirement of training at the various levels to be given in the production unit. That will be done. And then once the complete system is put into close, or put in, in place, then an internal audit will be done. That just to check if all the uh, clauses, all the implementation has been done as per the plan. Now when we are checking or when we are verifying, uh, by doing, verifying your system, by conducting an internal audit, there will be various non-conformities observed. 
like okay this should have been done as per this requirement it is not done the as per that requirement like that various non conformities can be observed then what is the next step to put all these non conformities i have to put corrective actions in place then finally a meeting is all finally is done to review of the complete progress of the uh, implementation of the system then conduction of third party audit what is a third party audit third party audit is audit done by a uh, an external person when they come and do the audit they certify the you know yes, yes all the implementation as per the requirement of the standard is done and the unit can be officially declared as a unit which is uh, functioning under iso 22000 that is in nutshell now let's go to implementation in a typical food industry now here a typical food industry is taken okay and i understand by reading that here the typical uh, example is taken for of uh, um, uh, food pulp fruit it is called it is the fruit pulp industry example has been taken and then it says about the kick off meeting the meeting will begin with the address of the top management wherein the top management will explain the purpose of implementation the time frame and the scope that within this time we need to implement the system in place after the kick off the meeting the introduction of the standard the standard is introduced what is the standard standard is the 22000 with all your prerequisites those procedures has to be introduced the procedure has to be implemented slowly each procedure which has been documented with all the records needs to be maintained and that is how the standard is introduced now the food safety policy the food safety policy is documented and then your food uh, you uh, we had seen the food safety manual all these policies are documented in a in a document called food safety manual now when you prepare all this there is some objective what is the objective there are certain objectives set now in this typical example you will see in page number 64 in your study material in unit 11 page number 64 you will find that certain objectives are given what is the objective reduce the aseptic bag losses reduce the fruit spoilage reduce the downtime reduce diesel consumption per met, uh, metric ton implement fifo first in first out for the packaging material and ingredients okay these are the objectives that by implementing the management will say by implementing the system this is my objective and this is what i am planning to achieve safe food as well as all these objectives has to come along with the system then a formation of food safety team is done in a food safety team the consists of the team will have a representatives of all the department okay all the department representative should be there otherwise it doesn't become a team uh, because the requirement is not only in the production line all the branches like the you know the raw material the purchasing the packaging material the store everything has to come into this complete loop only then there can be a product there can be a, a safe and good quality product uh, can come out for that the representation in this team should be there from each and every department now here the consultant has to keep in mind that he should conduct specific training of the food safety team now what happens is now you have found the team but how will the team know what has to be done and who has to be done and what will be the roles and responsibilities of the each person that has to be defined that has to be defined the competence requirement the skill requirement the training requirements 
and if it is not there, then they are need to be trained. That is how the team is formed and then the team is trained. Now here you will find that uh, what happens, the majority industries remain rooted in traditional clusters like mango processing in Chittur, part of Maharashtra and Gujarat. Fish industry is in coastal area. Okay. Now here they have taken a typical example of a fruit pulp. Okay. Now in fruit pulp, when they are taking an example of a fruit pulp, a septic mango processing organization, what kind of knowledge should the team leader have? What kind of requirements should be there for the, you know, the uh, material which is coming in? whether it should be ripe mango, whether it should be raw mango and then ripened in the factory or whether it should be, you know, from which farm it should come, what should be the requirement of the farms, should the farmers use uh, pesticide or if at all they are using pesticide, what should be the level at which they can use, all these are defined. Now if you, if you go to page number 65, you will find that the complete planning, how that uh, manpower team designing is done. Role in the food safety team, food safety team leader. What, what is the requirement? Minimum requirement is BTEC food technology. Then requirement, required minimum experience, see work experience of aseptic cannon processing. He should have, this is the requirement or this is the system requirement which is defined by the management and then accordingly it has to be implemented. So now the consultant says that if you want a good system to be in place, this is the requirement of a team leader. Team leader should have minimum this much of uh, skill and this much of experience, 10 years experience. Then below the team leader there are various people working, food safety team member or for production. B.Tech or a B.Sc. chemistry person is enough. What should, what knowledge should he have? He should have food safety and microbiological concepts he should know. He should be able to look at the raw material and say whether it is good or not. Okay, they are in the production team. Now a team member, QA. What is it? Quality assurance. Quality assurance, minimum the requirement is B.Sc. microbiologist with five years of experience. What all knowledge he should have, it is also listed here. Then food safety team member from the maintenance. Now what is the maintenance? Maintenance of various machinery, maintenance of various production line. Okay. And what are the required minimum expertise? Basic knowledge of food safety should be there. Work experience and aseptic processing they should know knowledge of calibration techniques. Why a calibration technique they should know? Because supposing it is a packaging, maintenance of a packaging uh, machine, okay, the 200 ml needs to be displayed, uh, dispersed in each packet. Whether the machine is dispersing 200 ml in the final processing or in the final packaging or it is dispensing 220 uh, ml. If it is dispensing 220 ml, the company is in loss. If it is dispensing 180 ml instead of 200, the customer is in loss. So what happens when the customer is in loss and after some time, the customer realizes that he is in loss, the reputation of the company is lost. And the company faces a lot of um, loss due to the loss in the market. What happens when the loss in market takes place? Uh, obviously, the complete product gets uh, rejected by the customer. They say, oh, okay, don't take that product because they claim 200 ml, but actually it is only 180 ml. So that is the, that is the importance of calibration. Okay, and once you lose that uh, image, it is very difficult to bring it back. Uh, and all these are being, uh, why this system is put into place? Because such things does not happen. Now this is the team. Team has been defined. What was the next step? 
description of the products and its internal use. So what is that uh, description of the product? Product is, it was defined as aseptic mango pulp. Okay, now if you read this, you can understand what is the weight, what is the nutrition value, all, all that has to be defined. When your product characteristics are defined, you will see that in the table, I will tell you the page number is 67, you will find that in this example, in this case study, how nicely they have defined the end product characteristic. We have said that it is aseptic fruit pulp. A fruit pulp is there. Now, that is the product name. Raw material used is, is the fruit, citric and ascorbic acid. Why citric and ascorbic acid is used? It may be used as a preservative or as an enhancer of food taste. Then specific product specification. Specific product specification is color, flavor and taste as per the product specification. If it is pineapple, it should be pineapple. If it is yellow color required, it will be yellow. The flavor, if it is, you know, the flavor, uh, whatever additional flavor is required, that particular flavor, it is whether it is pineapple, orange or lemon or whatever. General product specification will be the appearance and all that. And then the, you know, the texture, all this will be the clarity, all will be the general product specification. Preservation method, it can be pasteurization because here they are already given an example of aseptic fruit pulp. Definitely pasteurization is one of the steps because it is aseptic. Then primary packaging, aseptic bags. Secondary packaging, virgin polythene liner in white epoxy coated painted MS drum. See, aseptic bags are the primary packaging. Then these packages go to the secondary packaging. What is the shelf life? One year from the manufacturing date. See, all these are there in the end product characteristics. Now, all this has been defined. This is all a part of your uh, teamwork which is done for setting up, implementing the system. Then the prerequisite programs. What are the prerequisite programs? Environmental hygiene, and hygienic production of food sources, handling, storage and transport, cleaning, maintenance, personal hygiene and primary production. All these are the production related. Next one is establishment design facility. How should it be designed? Now this, the design of the facility is also very, very important. Why? Right? Supposing the design, the production uh, unit has the walls are having a lot of designs, lot of, you know, protrusions. All these protrusions will accumulate dust. And this dust can come into the food chain. So the walls should be very smooth. The corners should be, you know, in such a way that there are no cobwebs and all that. Cleaning is very easy. Right. So that is the design. Control of operation. How do you control the operation? The material which is incoming, the packaging materials has to be of good quality. The water, which is very, very important in all these food industry, the water quality of water is very important. And then the establishment maintenance and sanitation. Overall, you have to maintain the cleaning program should be there. Pest control is another major issue in all the food uh, industries. How to control the pest? Establishment of personal hygiene. That is the people who are working there. Now with this pandemic uh, situation, now we are facing the situation, we would have seen that in all the industries, they will segregate the person who is sick. They will ask them to stay away. That has to be there in, in all the cases. But now we are coming this. Uh, we are coming across this situation. We are, people are more aware about all that. Isn't it? Then the transportation, the general requirements for transportation, lot identification, the training. Now all this can be performed as per a documented procedure 
only if the people are well trained and you have a well written down instructions. Then the flow diagrams, process steps and control measures. If you go to the next page, you will see that a complete flow diagram is given very nicely about this particular example. How it is being done, receiving of raw material, inspection of raw material not okay, return to supplier. Then unloading, transfer of fruits to ripening, ripening is done, then it is sorted out, ripe fruits are taken, it is taken in a conveyor belt, inspection of fruits is done, first fruit washer, first it is washed and then it is gone to the second fruit washer. After that finally they have not uh, done, it is just given continue, continue means the uh, next steps. Okay. Yeah. While describing each step, describe the control measure and the level, the ideal possible level of applying the control measure. Then the hazard analysis. Now in the flow diagram you will see that very nicely all the steps are being given. Okay. And after that second fruit washer it will continue. All these steps it will continue with, it, it will go to crusher, from there it will go to strainer, whatever, whichever example we take. Now how a hazard in each step, what all hazard can be there and how it is controlled. Earlier when we were telling about the HACCP, I told you there are three kinds of hazard. One is biological hazard, second is the chemical hazard and third is a physical hazard. Now, in each step, you have to document the food uh, team documents what all kinds of hazard can happen, is likely to happen. It is um, uh, noted down. And then a high risk that is likely to happen, give it a, how it is rated, see 10, medium risk is 5, low risk is 3 and then Critical severity will automatically result in an unsafe product. If it is critically severe, it, it will give rise to an unsafe product. For example, if we are taking an example of a fruit juice uh, a mango processing unit, if the mango itself has is already infested, supposing the ripe mango, you would have come across uh, an exam experience when you cut the mango and you find that inside the mango there are small creepy crawlies, you know, uh, small small worms are there. So if the raw material itself has that worms, that is a biological hazard and that it is already there in uh, raw material. That is a critical control point which you cannot correct any time. And what is, what is the measure which you do? That each and every fruit is being. And then receiving of raw fruits. See, then the bacterial. B is given for the identification of a biological hazard. What is a biological hazard? Chances of contamination with pathogen. E. coli, salmonella, fungus, aspergillus. What is aspergillus? It is a fungus. Candida, albicus you do unclean truck and tarpaulin. From the unclean truck, all these bacteria, everything can come. Right? And then, that is the step one, that is receiving. Step one, again, receiving of raw fruits, chemical. What are the chemical contaminants which can come? Uh, Cross-contamination due to residues of hazardous chemicals during loading, transport and it doesn't mention about, okay, it is mentioning about the pesticides sprayed on fruit just before harvesting and also the, um, you know, the um, chemicals which are used for ripening, they are also very dangerous. We, are, we have always come across the articles in the newspaper where they say that for the ripening of mangoes they are using carbide, which is very dangerous. It is not good. Many of these pesticides have been classified as carcinogens. So it should not be used. Then next, what is the physical contamination uh, hazard? Physical contamination is foreign material like wood, stones, leaves, 
dirt, etc. All this can come. But uh, which is the step which is mentioned here? Receiving of raw fruits. So in this step, all these control hazards are first identified, classified, and what is the step? What has to be done? You will find that in one of next column, it is the risk analysis is done and the current PRP. PRP is hazard identified as significant or not is the last step. It is, if it is significant, it says S. If it is not significant, it says NS. Okay, that depends upon the fruit, the uh, flow chart of the, uh, of the process. Then you, uh, you will see that receiving of raw fruits. Okay, receiving of raw fruits, all these are given. How? Fr uh, fresh, first fruit washer. Then it goes to after receiving, it goes to the washer. And there in washer, what is very important? It is the quality of water. So checking of acidity, pH again, specification using calibrated equipment. All those are, it is very nicely, stepwise, it is being developed. Then the control measure assessment. Now in all these steps, there are control measures to be put in place. The effect of, CM is the control measure. The effect of CM on hazard at current level of applied fitness, monitoring feasibility of control measure. All these control, various kinds of control measures are put in various steps. Whether there should be a dirt, it cannot be accepted. If it comes in dirty trucks, it cannot be accepted. If the uh, raw material, you know, by sampling, they will cut open the fruits. If there is any fruit which worms, that complete lot will be rejected. All those measures, control measures are put in place and it is done. It, it is checked. Now you will see operational prerequisite programs, that is OPRP. What is OPRP? Receiving of, again receiving of rock tools, uh, then instruction to suppliers about pesticide, about the current control measures. And then what do you monitor? Monitoring is microbial con contamination due to fruit damage and pesticide residues. How do you measure? By visual inspection, by chemical analysis of finished products from external lab. Corrections and corrective actions, if it is found, then you have to set the limits. If it is found that it is more, then it has to be rejected. And what is verified? Chemical contamination due to pesticide residues is verified by inspection record at the time of arrival and also randomly. Then you will find the HACCP plan and in detail, it is given from X to Y. See, in detail, uh, it is given uh, pasteurization and molding. Each step is described here. The step name is given, then the step number in the flow chart, the number is given, the type of hazard is given, description of hazard, and the critical limits. Okay? See, in this, uh, this is the chart in page number 75. In this page number 75, if you just take one example, that is the pasteurization and holding is the step. The step number is 29. The hazard which is an, uh, identified is biological. Insufficient temperature and time of pasteurization holding may lead to biological hazard from X to Y degree. A temperature is defined there. So, a septic processing handbook, that is the reference given to the handbook from where the limits have been defined. Okay, now current measures have been defined. Monitoring. Now you are telling that this temperature to this temperature is critical. So, what do you monitor? You have to monitor temperature for the sterilization. And if it goes beyond, what do you have to do? You have to reject, revert or dispose that particular batch. And then the verification. Verification, you go back, you check your temperature records, the uh, graph, whether the complete, all through the processing of the production, whether it was under control or not. 
Now, verification of food safety management system. Verification of food safety is product description. Whether it is, how do we verify? We do by a audit, isn't it? So you go back, you check. How many times do you verify? It is verified yearly. Food safety team does the verification, reviewing the adequacy. You have to look into the customer complaints. You have to look into all the all the step. Every step needs to be audited. Traceability is done. Whatever records are maintained, that has to be again reviewed and checked whether your objectives are met or not. The following uh, procedure, then it goes to say what are the mandatory procedures to be put in place. Control of documents, we have already seen that the control of documents, what is the control of document, control of records, handling of potentially unsafe product. You have already identified that the product can be unsafe. How you will ident uh, handle it? Procedure of correction, corrective action, withdrawal, as well as internal audit. All these mandatory procedures we have already seen under the structure and documentation. Now, validation of control measure, combination that is whatever control measures are put in place, how we are measuring it and checking, monitoring each step, whether it is under control or it is going beyond the limit. Then the emergency preparedness, see, in a food industry, so if it is a high temperature, it can be emergency category is fire. So if it is fire, keep fire extinguisher in identified places, announce evacuation procedure, you know, and that the procedure will always have what all things needs to be immediately taken care of that you have to put off the gas valves, pumps, emergency shut off switch, all those things. These are also to be reviewed. Then the emergency category is power shutdown, food, uh, flood, what has to be done under these are the emergency categories which is uh, defined. Then the external communication, raw material supplier, certificate of analysis, what is the external communication? That is, you are, you are getting the raw material from other people, you are getting packaging materials. See, one, so, Once uh, these uh, things are in place, that is once a production unit is running, you are also depending upon so many other external services. The material, raw material is supplied by a supplier, patch, packaging materials coming from uh, other person, there are external laboratories whom you are, on whom you are depending, you are depending upon the pest control with somebody else. So, you need to have a complete documented structure for each of these external services also. And there is why the communication with these uh, external uh, um, service providers and holds the importance. That is, you have to give the proper instruction what is your requirement and what is your objective should go to even these external service providers. Internal communication is internally you need to communicate what all has to be followed, what which SOP needs to be followed and who will communicate this. For the communication, training uh, sessions needs to be um, uh, conducted and then how the analysis is done, how the hazard analysis is done. If there is an identification of a hazard, who should report to whom, how the communication within the organization should work that a system should be there. Then the complaints associated with the product, severity of the complaint has to be uh, looked into, traceability of the complaint, then it has to be investigated what kind of complaint it was and correction uh, has to be done. In case a recall of the product has to be made, the product needs to be recalled. So with that, we end these all these four units of uh, ISO 22000. Again, at the end of your unit, a uh, keywords are given, and the description or uh, you know a brief description of these keywords are given. 
So thank you very much. We have covered all these four uh, units today.